What's up, guys? I'm here today with Matthew Lopez. We are going to review a sub two Tampa deal uh, that we've been looking at. Uh, we have uh, several different exit strategies, and we'll see. You'll see a few of them here on the uh, notes here. Uh, some of them are midterm, short term, pad split, wraparound mortgages are are some of our main ones, and long term rental is also one of our exit strategies. So what we wanted to do was deep dive into this deal to see if it is a deal or it's not a deal. Now, I was telling Matt yesterday, I always like to look at uh, things that kill the deal right off the back. That way I can eliminate, eliminate it from my plate altogether, because we all know that, you know, we get a lot of deals sent to our inboxes and wholesalers are hitting us up. Realtors are hitting us up. Everybody's always trying to sell us a deal. And so that's why I talk about guys. It's very important. You set up your buy box and you stay within those parameters. Remember each exit strategy is going to have a different buy box. So Matt talked or hit me up the other day and he said, Hey man, I got this Tampa deal. It's sub two. This deal is actually sourced through a wholesaler. It's a pre foreclosure. And uh, the wholesaler is trying to get Matt to execute on this deal. And we're kind of just walking through it, the numbers. He's actually physically walked through the property. I haven't. So we know this deal really inside and out right now. But the really the main purpose of this is, guys, to show you guys if this deal is something worth executing on or if it isn't. And that's the important thing for you guys to know is the numbers, guys. Don't remember I want to stress one thing and one thing that I want you guys to take away from this video is if this deal doesn't work, don't worry, guys, because there's so much positive that comes out of it. So, for instance, um, you know, Matt, he's just getting uh, into real estate. And so now he walked through the deal. He got to feel the deal. He got to feel something that's tangible. He got to feel and smell the house. He got to see how the kitchen condition was, see how the flooring was, see how the paint was. He gets to see all these different aspects. So the amount of good that has come out of it, to me, I never say there's any bad because now he's learned and learned a new market. A, he got to drive a new neighborhood. He got to see a new exit strategy. He's gotten to feel and touch and smell real estate. He's got to learn all these different things. So if this deal is not a deal, guys, don't don't uh, always remember there's so many deals out there uh, that will be a deal. So don't rush into a bad deal. Make sure you buy a good deal. And that's the point uh, that you guys are here today. So before we continue on, guys, make sure you like and subscribe this uh, video. That way you can stay up to date for all the content that we're going to be delivering to you guys so you guys can see real life deals that we're doing and we're really focusing on creative right now. Creative finance is subject to where we're taking over properties that have existing mortgages and then seller finances are typically deals where they're owned free and clear by a seller. So that's one of our main strategies on the acquisition side. So Matt, uh, let's dive into these numbers here uh, with the folks and, you know, kind of give them a rundown and being that you've walked through this property, you can, you know, correct me, you know, if I'm wrong on anything. So we put this sheet together guys here. So you can see it's in Tampa, Florida here. Um, we have right now a potential entry fee of $28,000. And what I was telling Matt yesterday was this is a pre foreclosure. And so until you get that reinstatement on a pre foreclosure, this is a pro tip. Make sure that you get that reinstatement and that lien search so you know exactly what the numbers are. So, you know, it's an estimated approximate number of $28,000. And so the breakdown, guys, arrears. If you guys don't know what arrears means, arrears means the money that the seller has not been paying on their mortgage. They're in default. So they're probably in default by, you know, uh, six months, I would say, six months, almost to a year. Um, I believe the PIT on this one's what, $2,400. So uh, they're 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 in definitely several months back on their mortgage. So that's what arrears means. Anytime you see the word arrears, it always means that the seller has defaulted on their property. And this is a pre-foreclosure. So if you see arrears, think pre-foreclosure and the seller hasn't been paying their mortgage. Uh, he put title. So title for closing costs is about $5,000 for the sub two deal. Um, probably going to be, you know, upwards of 6,500, but we always like to under, uh, under, um, overestimate then rather than us underestimate, but it could go up to 6,500. We don't know exactly yet because remember we have to see what all the fees from the title company are. These are just rough estimates. So a wholesale fee from the wholesaler is $10,000. Always remember you can negotiate with these wholesalers directly, especially if they're not moving these deals. Like for instance, Matt, this guy's been hitting you up. Uh, he's been on top of you like to buy this deal. Right. Yeah. And I told him yesterday, I was like, 
Well, one good question for you to ask him is why isn't this deal selling? You know, why isn't this yeah. deal selling? And so he came back to you talking about the code enforcement violation, et cetera. But it's funny because you can see that there's a sense of urgency for him, for you to buy that deal. Anytime you guys see that and somebody's following up with you consistently day over day, day over day, Hey, you have any updates? Hey, do you want you know, you know that their fees negotiable. So like, I can tell you right now, this guy rather make slow bucks better than no bucks. And that means he rather make a dollar than zero dollars. And so the ten thousand uh, uh, dollar um, wholesale fee is negotiable. Always know that, guys. Um, unless it's like a steaming hot deal in the market that we're in today, I'm starting to actually see. Uh, I haven't mentioned this to you, but I look at a lot of creative deals, Matt, and I'm starting to see a lot of creative deals are now starting to sit on the market, meaning that the wholesaler or the person who's direct to seller hasn't locked it up or direct to agent hasn't locked it up at either uh, um, terms that are, um, you know, buyable to an end buyer like us. Mm -hmm. And so the prop the properties have an issue selling, right? So the entry fee is too high, for, for example, right? Or the interest rate is too high. Like I'm starting to see people lock up deals sub to 7% interest rates and they're blasting them out to the community and to the world to try to get people to buy them. Like that's a super unattractive interest rate. Now I'm not saying there's not a buyer out there for that, but majority of people aren't going to want to take out or take a two, a, to take on a 7% interest rate. Now, somebody who's getting a primary residence that might be appealing to them because they can be a penalty box buyer, but yeah. um, going into this stuff a little bit more, when you walk through the property, uh, Matt, um, kind of give us a little bit of insight why I go through these numbers, um, some stuff that, you know, we should be, you know, looking out for. We pretty much have plugged everything on the sheet that we want you guys to be aware of, but we want to show you guys the numbers and stuff like that. He's actually physically walked through the property. So he's going to know once we get down to like repair estimates and stuff like that, what that would cost. Because remember there's seven uh, parts to an entry fee guys. And so these are just some of them. Yeah. Right. So what you see here on Javier's screen, when we talk about kind of some of the exit strategies, when the deal was brought to, to my table, we initially went and looked at the property online. We went to Zillow. We're checking it out, looking at photos. Uh, the wholesaler gave me some information as well on what the property has been before, where it's at. And so uh, to give story on the property itself is it was a three bedroom, two bath, but it was being utilized as a duplex. The current owner, which I believe is in another investor, um, turned it into a, a two uh, living quarter. So a two, ba a two bedroom, one bath up in the front. They yep. walled off the back into a one bedroom, one kitchen, one bath uh, studio or, or one bedroom in the back because it was separate and uh, code violations came out and found yep. out that they weren't allowed to have the duplex. And so uh, this has been sitting on the market for, I think, about five months now with nobody in it. Wow. So there's a lot of pain there right now with the seller, yeah. the investor. He's not making any money on it right now. Um, we're going to get through the numbers here in a little bit, but just to give you an idea of when it came to my table, I wanted to say, well, well, if I'm going to be the investor or if I'm going to give this or try to find out an investor to take it over, what's the best exit strategy? And so me and Javier sat and talked for about a good hour on three potential exits that would be um, the best for this property in this location and what we could see online before walking the property. And initially, um, I was thinking um, month um, midterm rental, maybe doing something with nurses and or yeah. corporate stuff into yep. it. Um, but what I put on here underneath is that we're not actually really familiar with actually yep. doing midterm rentals and making sure we could secure tenants. So there is no experience there and making sure, oh, well, once it's ready to go, could we fill this up right away? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we didn't have an expert. We don't have someone we know. So we, if we did take it and pass it on to an MTR expert, that was an idea, uh, but we didn't want to take it on. So that exit really um, was not uh, feasible, especially down yeah. here. I did some research for the nurses in that area. They had a, uh, there's online platforms. Now you can research rooms. The going rate for the whole, um, unit would have been cash flow positive in that area, but not having an experience actually working with the nurses, uh, traveling nurses to fill it up. I don't know yep. the numbers. There's uncertainty there on how long, the, like, can we even get a nurse to stay in there for yep. 30, 60, 90 days. So that was a big concern for me for this first exit strategy. Yeah. And so one thing I want to also point out, guys, remember when you hear the word subject to, I'm just giving you guys this for some food for thought. 
there's only two reasons why a seller would sell sub two, right? Typically, right? This is 99.9% .9 of the time. Either A, they have some financial distress, which they do here because it's a pre-foreclosure, or B, it's a low equity lead. Those are the only other two, the only times you see somebody who's really going to do entertain seller finding, or excuse me, subject to, right? And so this person, going back to what I said previously, is they're in, they're in default on their mortgage. They defaulted on their mortgage and they're in financial pain. A wholesaler has now contacted that seller and that wholesaler is trying to sell the deal, sell their equitable interest in the deal. Yeah. That, right. And so now we're going through these exit strategies. Now I want you guys not to get so caught up in being the best at all the exit strategies. My suggestion is pick one or two and be good at it. See if those exit strategies are aligned with your goals. And if they're not, you can throw those exit strategies away. But being that I've been investing in a real estate for many, many years now, I have a lot more tools in my tool belt and a lot more exit strategies than most people who are just getting into this. But I don't want you guys to be overwhelmed because we're about to talk about several different exit strategies here. Pick one or two and be good at it. One or two and be good at it. Understand it, ins and outs. Do it, do a deal, see if you like it. If you don't like it, like I make example, I did wraps, you know, this year, I did five wraps this year. I'm not touching wraps anymore, right? I know how to do them. I, I can do them uh, effectively, but I just don't want to do them. It's not, it's not aligned with what I'm, my financial goals are. Right. And yeah. so I want to marry my money and not date my money. Rap is more dating money. I want to marry my money. Right. And so it wasn't aligned to what I wanted to do. I'm not saying it's not a good exit strategy. I'm saying it's just not aligned with what I'm looking for and my financial goals, my financial goals, Matt's financial goals, and your financial goals are all going to be different. So we're going to talk about these different exit strategies. I want you guys to get familiar with the exit strategies, but pick one or two and be the master at it. And if it doesn't work for you in the future, then you can, you know, keep it on your tool belt, not throw it away and utilize it because the name of this game guys is not to skip over deals that potentially could be a deal, but you don't know how to analyze it because you don't have the right exit for it. So this property in particular, like he said, I don't do midterm rentals. He doesn't do midterm rentals. We're not saying it's a bad midterm rental. We're just saying that we don't have the expertise. We're not going to go down that rabbit hole because it's not worth it, right? We're, we're putting our time and energy on deals that we're experts in, right? Yeah. And I'm glad, he brought, I'm glad you brought that up, Javier, because that's part of um, what I've learned being a part of this, the Gator community, Paces uh, community in general, and, and working with you and you giving me some some guidance. But at the end of the day, when you're looking at a deal, you have to look at all of the potential exit strategies so you can find what's going to make the like the investor want this deal. And if you're the investor, why would you want to keep it? And yep. so these first two exit strategies, they just don't fit what we want as an investor, our time, our energy, our expertise, and we don't want to deal with maybe some of the headaches. Now that I'm going to talk about the second exit strategy that Javier just spoke about, which is a wrap. Yeah. We looked at, well, we could wrap this thing because there's equity in the deal. Right now, the mortgage is only 244 and the ARV in that area, if you do renovations, is somewhere upwards to about 400000 mm -hmm. Now, if we do renovations cost, um, the, the wholesaler who was giving it to me said there's about a $60,000 spread on the equity could that could be gained if you were to fix and flip it and then uh, wrap and do a wrap on the back end side of it. Um, but what Javier has told me because he has tons of experience doing wraps is he's like, I'm done doing wraps. Wraps are just too much time, too much headache. Um, yeah. they're not as secure or, and, and, and me being an early investor, he's like, dude, you're just starting out. Don't start with wraps. I mean, you'll learn a lot. You, you'll, you'll definitely, you know, get your stripes, but I wouldn't make that your first priority when there's all these other other exits that are so much more easier to do as an early investor. And so when I went to go look at the property for a wrap potential exit, after walking the property, after driving through the neighborhood, yep. I kind of categorized the neighborhood in the community kind of like a low C, maybe D neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking to myself as a buyer, like, man, if I was moving to Tampa and I wanted to buy a home in this area for 400000 would I spend 400000 to live on this street next to the highway in this neighborhood, in this community? And I'm telling myself, I'm not buying this for 400000 right? Yep. And even if I, even if we did the best upgrades to the house and made it look beautiful on the inside, and the outside, the overall community, I feel that as a buyer, someone who has bought a house and a home here in Orlando, that would be a huge factor why I wouldn't spend that much money and get a mortgage on that. So that's why I said, I'm not going to do the wrap as an opportunity. Plus Javier's like, like he doesn't yeah. want to do the paperwork behind it, the legwork to making yeah. it a wrap. 
So yeah. that's why we didn't go with exit number two. Yeah. And, and also let me add on a little bit on the rap side of things. Like a lot of people, I get a lot of calls because people see that I've sold wraps or I got wraps that I'm now finalizing. I have a couple that I'm finalizing right now as we we're doing this video. Um, a lot of people don't realize with wraps, they hear the word wrap and, you know, oh, I'm excited. It can yield me a lot of cash flow, which it can, and you can have infinite returns on them. Um, but the only issue is if you don't really delegate all the outreach and all the incoming messages that you're going to get, you'll be bombarded just on one house, thousands, hundreds of messages, people on Facebook, hitting you up your phone blowing up. I mean, the amount of calls, incoming calls and messages that you'll get and the outbound that you need to do the outbound reach is crazy. It is cr like, it's like, it's like a full-time job. And I actually did all that, right? I I I was the person actually listing it, uh, acquiring it. I did all aspects because I want to learn all 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 the positions when I when I first did it. And I told myself I was like, you know, I started getting a lot of people reaching me. I was like, hey man, how how the, how are your wraps moving? I say typically on a wrap, four to six month hold time. Typically, you're going to mark it up depending on the market that you're in. Ten percent on on, uh, on retail. So if it retails for four hundred thousand dollars and it would appraise for four hundred thousand dollars, you can mark it up ten percent to sell it to an end buyer, right? Um, you can take that interest rate that you locked up because typically on a wrap, it's a subject to a uh, property that you've taken over, let's say at two and 3% or 4%. And you're now marketing up to what interest rates, what banks are right now, which are six, seven or 8%, right? You're looking for a penalty box buyer. But when you go and market for these properties, when you put the word seller finance, what I found out is you get people who jump 20 feet high, which are investors. And they're like, oh, owner financing. Oh, let me, let me inquire on this property. And you yeah. get 99.9 .9 of them are all, all, all investors. And they're really not serious about the deal. They're not serious about underwriting it. They're not serious about taking it down. They're just inquiring, hoping and praying that they get a deal one day, that they lock up, that they're not going to really perform on. And so on a wrap, if you're going to do it, my suggestion is, Find your penalty box buyer who's a homestead buyer, somebody who's got, you know, wife and kids and they're emotional about the purchase. Yeah. Not just, oh, I'm I, I'm an investor. I want to do an M MTR, STR, or whatever. Like you get all these investors that reach out and they and they don't they're they're they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. Yeah. And so you get a lot of noise and it's just it just becomes noise after a while. So if you have the right systems and processes in place, you can scale that business. But when I said earlier, I like to uh, marry my money, not date my money. What I mean by that is on a wrap, if I sell it to you today and mark it up that $400,000 house, 10%. Now I'm marking it up to 440, right? Well, mm -hmm. let's say in 15 years, this person's still paying me. They're great. They're a great owner that I found homestead buyer and they're still paying me. And this property is now worth 550. Well, guess what? Or 650 or whatever. You don't get to capture that, that equity. You're locked in at that 440 that you sold that deal to them for. Yep. Right. You don't get the tax depreciation on the deal. You didn't, you don't, you just get strictly cash flow. It's a cash flow play. 100% cash flow play on, on the deal. And for me, I wouldn't touch wrap unless I'm net net eight to a thousand dollars a month. It's not worth my headache for me to do eight to a thousand dollars a month where I want to be. Right. Cause yeah. typically you make, remember I told you uh, the other day, you make money three ways on a wrap, a unicorn wrap. Let me specify a unicorn wrap. So if you raise money or use your own money, typically you would get recoup that from the end buyer that you're going to sell it to that penalty box buyer. You're going to get a uh, uh, interest rate margin. You're going to get that built-in equity, and then you're going to get um, uh, the cash flow, right? Yep. So you're making money three different ways on a wrap. So yep. this is this is this is it's, it's a beauty uh, when you do it the right way. But those are unicorn deals. So yeah, yeah, and and I would say yeah, just in terms of you know the knowledge you have about doing it, um, you know my you know, the, those of you that are watching this now, like part of why Javier and, and I was like, man, this is going to be a great video for us to put out there is because as a new investor, I know a lot about all the strategies. I have tons of knowledge. I think I've, we've said this before on a previous show, but I've never executed and had to do like the front, like all the paperwork that Javier's have had to done. And so I'm thinking like, me walking the property, I probably wouldn't be emotionally invested to buy in that neighborhood for 400,000 plus all the paperwork that comes with it. I'm like, nope, I just exit. Yeah. I just, 
turn that off my strategy. Like, yeah, it, doing- yeah. It's it, again, it, everybody has their own. I'm not saying it's a, it, it's a bad strategy. It's definitely scalable. You can definitely do it, but you have to have the right property. You know, you have to be, I recommend a major metro area and I wouldn't buy a home older than like 2005. I want something newer where you don't have a bunch of, uh, and the reason why I say CapEx is because when that, that end buyer comes in, that, that penalty box buyer that you're going to sell this to, you don't know if you're going to have to do repairs when they do their home inspection. So that's another, oh shit fund that you're going to have to have. A lot of, yeah. That's, just a lot of red flags on this property for it to be a yeah. wrap. So we just, yeah. It's, so we it's, just, it's not a, yeah. Yeah. So we just discarded it and stuff like that. So you know, uh, and that's not one of the extra strategies we're focused on. So we're really focused on right now being that we're in a market when I saw this business model, it, it spoke to me. It spoke to me because I've been on both sides of the spectrum. I've been on the uh, uh, bedroom rental side. Then I've also been on now I'm the host side, the investor side of creating affordable housing uh, properties for these individuals, right? And so we have the workforce right now that, the basic workforce that is struggling to find affordable housing. There is thousands and thousands and thousands of people across the nation that need affordable housing that they can't find affordable housing. And so now what pad split has done has created a platform to where me, the investor, the host can put a property on their platform. They do all the vetting. They do the credit check. They do the employment verification. They do all the stuff, all the, all the heavy lifting, the initial heavy lifting, and they will connect a member with the investor and guess what it's a win-win because that member now has something that's affordable that they can live in that's comfortable where they don't have to have long-term commitments and all this upfront money of deposits they have to pay and then the investor has their risk spread way wider right because now they have multiple members paying in that one home versus just one tenant and i get a higher roi and it's fulfilling because i'm able to help solve the affordable uh, co-living situation that we're facing right now in America, right? And yeah. so one of our exits that we looked at on this property was a pad split. Yeah. And Matt will tell you right in a second more about how we can configure this floor plan in it to be in a pad split. I know you guys have seen a lot of content that we're posting on the pad split. And I'm telling people right now, double down on pad split because it is something that is necessary and you're going to get a higher return. And a lot of these properties that you're coming across will fit a pad split if it has the right square footage, bedroom, bathroom count, and it's in the right market. Yeah. Yeah. So I went out to uh, Tampa to check this property out. Um, I don't believe, was it yesterday or the day before yesterday? Totally forgot. Um, I think it was the day before yesterday. And I went and walked the property, uh, looked at some of all the cosmetics and everything. Uh, there's definitely need some work to be done, some renovations that need to be done. We'll get into the numbers um, down. But uh, the reason why I needed to get out there and look to see if it can convert into a pass split is because Javier, who has already converted one of his Airbnbs into a pass split and is you know heavily into getting another property already that's going to be turning into a pass split, yeah. um, we're finding out that having properties... Um, they need to be a five plus kind of uh, layout. They like, they've got to be able to have at least five, a minimum of five people, five rooms potentially to really make the property cash flow and be a good pad split exit. Mm-hmm. Well, this property came to us as a three, two, right? right? So when we looked at the photos, we didn't, couldn't really tell. And there was no floor plan on whether or not could we convert some of the extra space yep. into those extra bedrooms? Can we add two or three extra bedrooms to the layout? And so, Javier's like, you got to get out and walk the property so you can see it, so you can feel it, so you can see if there's room to make um, and adjust it and add those bedrooms. So I went out and walked the property and um, my initial gut on where we can make some room, I do believe we can get it to a minimum of five bedrooms. There's a possibility we could get it to six, but I'm really stretching like we'd have to really like really get tight on the front unit on a certain in the front area. Um, to make that extra bedroom. And those first two bedrooms would be really, really tight. But I ran the numbers as a 6-2. So the numbers we're going to look at here are 6-2. I didn't run the numbers for a 5-2, but um, because I walked the property and I saw that it could definitely do 5-2, now we're talking, okay, checkbox number one, five bedrooms or more. Can it have five bedrooms or more? Yes. All right. So now let's go to the next step, right? What's the local area? Like, what are the, uh, we'll talk about renovation numbers here in a second, but now go on pad split. What's the local average room rate? 
So I uh, went on to PassSplit. PassSplit has amazing tools that you can go right on in there. You don't even have to log in and create an account. It's actually just open for you right there. Search the, the zip code, find yep. the neighborhood, zoom in, and it'll show you all the available rooms in the area. So I tried to pick the five closest uh, rooms in the area next to where this property is at. And the average room rate was about $191 per week yep. for that room. So yep. after calculating the numbers for a six bedroom at an 80% occupancy, it would yield about 3705 per month wow. with a fully with 80% occupancy. Now, the PIT on this, if you look down below, the PIT on this is um, 2447. So currently, without expenses yet, we're a positive cash flow quite a bit. So now we got to dive into, well, what are all the other expenses? How is this, you know, what are we paying out? Um, for operating experience uh, expenses to make this a deal. So you'll see here in the highlighted um, area, yep. uh, I'm sorry, not the highlighted area. If you scroll down, okay, he scrolled down. We have all of our expenses, right? So we have our lawn, which is going to be about hundred bucks a month. We got power. That's going to be about 400 bucks a month. Um, I didn't do water or insurance. I hadn't, we hadn't written that. So we can write that in now. Um, but you know, with our cash flow, let's see if, uh, let me do the math here on my calculator. So 3705 minus 2447. We have yeah. about $1,258 in wiggle room of cash flow if it's 80% occupied as a 6 2 pad split. Yeah. So now if we want to subtract some of our operating expenses, right? So if we say minus 400 for gas, um, for power, minus another 100 for lawn, minus another, um, what are we going to pay for water? Do you think in that area? Or uh, probably, bro, like probably like 25 bucks a month. 20, okay. So minus yeah, 25 water, bucks. Water, water bills are cheap. And I would and say insurance, probably like 50 bucks. So check this out. Being that guys is a subject too. He just said the word PITI for you guys don't know what the word PITI. Oh is. yeah. Their insurance. Principal yeah. insurance taxes and insurance. Yeah, got it. Right. So cool. that's what PITI stands for. So we kind of know what that insurance bill is going to be already every month. Now they'll get us. Now we're obviously going to do a new insurance policy on the property. When you have a property, you take over subject to, we'll get, we'll deep dive in this uh, later on guys, but just a kind of general understanding. So you guys don't get lost when you take over a property subject to, that means that there's an existing mortgage that comes with that home. When you get the key to that property, there's already a mortgage in place. You do not need to go out and get a new loan. Right. Yeah. And so when you when that loan that we're taking over, there's principal insurance taxes, uh, uh, principal uh, insurance taxes and um, all incorporated in one payment. So when you look at that payment, it'll tell you what the escrow amount is. Do you know what the escrow amount is on it roughly? Um, I didn't look at it. No. No. OK. I have to look so at it again. Yeah. That one payment that they're paying every month will cover all those those things. And if you look at the mortgage statement, it will tell you what's in escrow current. But yeah. on that house right there, um, you're probably going to be about twenty five to three thousand dollars insurance a year. Now, obviously, that depends. Now, if the four major components of the property are updated, the roof, the plumbing, the electrical, the AC. Yeah, we'll get into that. Yeah. Is what the insurance company cares about. So. You have numbers here as um, you can plug those numbers in based on your PITI amount, right? yeah. With your principal insurance uh, uh, taxes and or principal interest taxes insurance. Yeah. And so um, I'm doing numbers here and we're putting it on the screen for everybody to see. And what, what I'm, I'm highlighting here is after like, here's our, here's our expenses. Now passport takes like 15%, correct? Yes. Yeah. And, and that, and is that 15% on the actual, what we're occupied at? Like if we're, if we make yeah. 3705. Correct. Correct. Right. So they're, they're only making money if we make money. Right. Got so, it. so, so they would make 550. Yeah. So we would have to pay them 555. And so we add that into our operating expenses. Yeah. And so just going over operating expenses right now, just to see like, will this cash flow? we're sitting at 35, 22, 57. And right. internet, make sure you put internet in there as well. Yeah, we'll yeah, we'll throw internet in here. Internet. And then you can bucks. Put, what do you think? 80 yep. to 100 bucks? Yep. And then if you want, uh also I always incorporate when I'm running my numbers, I always incorporate CapEx. If this property has been fully updated, you can do a 5% CapEx of the gross revenue. So you could take 5% of CapEx 
out of 35, 22 and 57. And you could take 5% of that number and you can use it as, again, that money's going to the side every month, just in case you have to replace a toilet, an AC, a roof, et cetera. Uh, older properties are going to have more CapEx. Newer properties are going to have less CapEx. If you're buying an older property and everything has literally been gutted and, and replaced, you're probably yeah. going to have you know equivalent CapEx to a newer property. But yeah. this property I know is 1920, so I would give a 5% to an 8%. Sometimes people want to be super conservative and they'll go a higher CapEx on it. But if you know that these major components and the uh, cosmetics have all been updated, then you can go 5% CapEx. Um, so I always definitely hundred, hundred percent throw that in there. Um, internet, you're probably going to be on, on a spectrum or AT&T, uh, plan for, you know, a month, you're probably gonna be about $70 a month. Yeah. I'll put 70. All yeah, right. 70, so, fine. Yeah. I'll put 70. Um, so now the number is three, seven, seven, five. Yep. Right. So then yeah, that's even. Right. So if we look at if we look at the number now, right, we add all our expenses. Right. So this is the importance of running your numbers, doing your due diligence and putting in some averages, because at an 80 percent occupancy, we're only making thirty seven oh five. We are now paying thirty seven seventy five. Yep. Right. Yep. And so, let me let me just chime in one other thing on this, because you could add a couple other things that are operating expenses as well. Remember, mm -hmm. you guys have fixed operating expenses and you have variable operating expenses. The variable operating expenses are stuff like power. We don't know exactly what power is going to be every single yeah. month. When we yeah. spoke about that about uh, yesterday, you could go one of two ways. You can obviously know by experience, which obviously a lot of people who are watching this, they don't have the experience, or you can actually literally call the power company and get a 12 month um, of what the power bill will, what was right. And they'll give you averages and they'll give you what power. bill. So a lot of uh, power companies will disclose to you what the power bill has been in the last year. Now, this property in particular hasn't been uh, occupied in what, five months, five months right now. Yeah. Uh, but so I always still go based off of, you know, you can use the power company or you can go based off of what you know, what a three, two or four, two or five, two power bill would be in that area. Right. Um, but yeah, so 30, 37, 75 is total operating expenses. One other thing too, guys, you could incorporate in that if you want this business to be 120% pretty much hands off would be a property manager to yeah. plug and somebody would be a property manager. Typical pro uh, property manager on a pad split is going to be between uh, for a six bedroom is going to be a, between two hundred and fifty to three hundred and fifty a month for a property. We're just going to play high because I like to play high. Right. right. Yeah. But and yeah. so, and by the way, I know that because I've interviewed a couple property managers for the pad splits that I'm doing to see if they're worth plugging into my business model. Yeah. Me personally. I'm actually going to go the VA route to where they're just doing all customer service to all my properties. So well, that's another conversation for another day, but that's an, another number you can plug in. Now, he's also a, a calculating for, you calculated for vacancies, right? So he did- Yeah, this is 80% This is eighty vacancy number, right? We good. This so, is 41.25 off on 80%. Perfect. So he's calculating for 20% in vacancies, guys. So he's calculating for his CapEx, his vacancy, his water, his power, his lawn- um, pad split management fee. Um, and so, yeah, everything is pretty much there. So you're, we're able to give people real life numbers here, right? Yeah. And so, you know, when we're looking at this and we want to look at worst case scenario, best case scenario, worst case scenario is if I can only fill it at 80%, I'm actually going to be negative. We're going to be negative about 400 bucks on this deal. Yeah. Right. So that's worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. Um, best case scenario, hundred percent, we are cash flowing about 500 bucks. Roughly, yeah. give, give or take, yep. right? Yep. So now the question comes down to whether or not we feel this property will be 100% occupied, right? Now we have to look at the market a little bit better. We got to look at all the pass splits in the area, call up some of our friends that we know and say, hey, in this area, like how like how many homes are actually 100% occupied in that area? Do we feel like we could fill this up quickly? Because now that we're running through the numbers in depth, and again, Javier, thank you for doing this with me. Yeah. I'm look, I'm leaning more and more towards not. This is not a deal. I don't want to risk, you know, trying to make money yeah. at a hundred percent occupancy with all of these other operating expenses. Yep, like that's where I feel right now. Yeah, and so this is the way I look at it too, right? It's very simple math, guys. Once you calculate all your total expenses for you to run this property on a monthly basis, right? And you deduct that from your 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 uh, your total cash flow. So what do we have here for total cash flow on the on the worst case scenario? 
on the 3705. Uh, uh, 3705 is 3705. Yeah, is, is okay. the and I'll bring it down here. So, so 30, 3705, guys, just so you can see, 3705 is worst case scenario. So, can you put worst case scenario next to that number so people can see this? Yep, 3705. And then we have what's best case scenario? Best case scenario is 4632. About 4632, guys. Yeah, this is on a six bed pad split. Yeah. I can spell best case scenario 4632. Yep. Right. And so like these are these are the operating expenses for 80% occupancy. So if we did get 4632, that number is actually going to grow higher. 632 times 0.15. So that number is going to be worst case, best case. We're going to pay another hundred bucks in cost to pad split. Yeah, and then do you have your PITI incorporated in there as well? Yeah, PITI is already incorporated in here, right here. Rent. Oh, rent. Okay, you put his rent. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I should have just PITI. Good. Yeah, good yeah, idea. yeah. Good, good. PITI yep. twenty four four seventy. Lawn, power, water. Principal, interest, tax, and insurance. Guys, don't yep. forget what that means. So, if it's at eighty percent, this is what we would pay to pad split. If it's at a hundred percent, we pay an additional one forty to pad split. Yep. Um, then we have the internet, capex property management, where I would say for me, for being me being an early investor, I'm not in Javier's uh, shoes yet. I would probably, um, I would do this here, which is, let me see if I can find format, uh, text, boom. I would probably, because I'm local and it's my first property to try to squeeze this as a deal. My only thing was I would come in and do the property management for the first year or so, so I can get understanding how to do property management, get my uh, get my feet wet, you know, not be so green behind the ears, save yep. myself that 350 bucks. Then if I did that and take the 4121, 4125 minus 350, I'm still like now I'm not as 3775, I'd be at 3775. So I'd be out 70 bucks per month, worst case scenario. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not as completely like, no way I'm never doing this deal. Like I would turn this down in a heartbeat. But if I take the property management off of this, I'm more likely to say, okay, maybe I sweat this out a little bit. Maybe because if I can get it to hundred percent, if we talk to the pad split people and they're like, man, this area is booming. We get hundred percent occupancy all the time. Yep. Then, you know, then I may consider doing it just being out $70 because I have all those other benefits that Javier talked about earlier. Right. I get yep. the tax depreciation. I get all the equity in the house, all those other great things. Yep. One other thing that I want to include in this operating expense list that we forgot to plug in is cleaning fee. Typically that is the, you don't, I mean, it's optional, but yeah. I just want people to understand like the cleaner your place is, the more people are going to want to stay or yeah. the retention rate is going to be longer. So what I'm factoring for cleaning fees on a home this size is about a hundred dollars a month. And that's just for the cleaner to go in there and clean the common areas, like the hallway, the kitchen, yeah. the bathroom, that's it, right? Yeah. They go in once a month and they go in, you know, that's 12 times a year. So you're about another $1,200 uh, annually in operating expenses just on the cleaner. Now, when you turn the rooms, typically I charge the member, which is uh, part of pad split. They're the member and they're my, you know, tenant, but they're a member. They're considered a member in pad split. I charge them a moving fee. That moving fee offsets when I have to turn that room in. So I look at that as like a wash, but for the common areas, I'm doing them once a month and I'm doing kitchen, bathroom, hallways, and just like the living area, dining area, et cetera. And they're just going in there. It probably takes them maybe an hour to do it. So it's pretty, pretty quick, easy money for them. Uh, but yeah, so mem unless, again, unless you're going to do it yourself, which I don't recommend, you know, we're not yeah. here to be cleaners. We're not here to pick up another job, but Matt made a good point. He wants to learn the ins and outs of the, uh, the the business. That way he can delegate and hand it off to like a VA or have his own in-house management company. You know, yeah. I ran the numbers on mine. Uh, since you know the scenario, when I ran the numbers on mine in Winter Park, it didn't make sense for me to do a property manager. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm just going to plug in, you know, my team yeah. on the short-term rental side to take care of all that management stuff. Yeah. Uh, that has to do it. And there's not really actually much ongoing management to be, uh, to be honest. Once the people live in there, 
That's it. I mean, there's automated messages where you can actually kick out to them right when they're going to uh, move in to where it's 100% hands off. Unless the toilet's not flushing or unless there's an issue with an uh, ongoing member to member dispute, there's really not much to manage. So I couldn't really justify the guy wanted uh, $350 to, to manage mine a month. I'm like, I couldn't really justify what he was doing, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. So let's, yeah, we'll wrap up here with final thoughts because now we, let's talk about how are we going to bring money to the table? Because I think this is a very important, especially if we're going to try to be very creative. Um, yeah. You know, if, if, if I had my own money and I was bringing it to the table, then, you know, even still, I may not do this deal because um, it's like, we have to look at a lot of the code violations that it's gone through. I have to go through and get it rezoned or recoded back to a single family home because it was a previously duplex. Yep. So I got to tear down a wall so it can be turned into a single family home. Um, then I got to pay inspection costs right yep. out the gate to make sure there's nothing major. There's no foundational structure. And in my walkthrough, we saw signs of possible structural damage. So there's potential there. And then when we calculated kind of overall renovation cost, might not including maybe a major structural thing, we're looking at about $12,000 renovation costs. And so Ultimately, ideally, if we were to get like try to bring in a private money lender, try to bring somebody else's money to the table, pay them back. Um, one, I did the math. Twenty four months wouldn't work. This would have to be like a very long, like seven sixty plus months um, payback because the monthly payment that would just destroy the cash flow on this property. We yeah. would not be able to. It would be a complete no. Um, trying to use somebody yeah. else's money to pay to get us into this deal, which right. is to not only cover the entry fee for up here, but then all the renovation costs, um, the non-occupied costs, us paying the mortgage because no one's in it yep. yet. Yep, yep, exactly. So, and so so I'll ultimately, start... I, like, even if it was my money, I still wouldn't get into this deal. Like this would... deal is looking like very like- Right, not, yeah. I, w I was telling Matt day one on this, these deals, right? The, the, issue, the big issue is obviously day one, you're not making money, you're losing money. Mm -hmm. So if you take all those operating expenses that we just- showed you down here obviously some of these aren't going to are, aren't applicable to when you're getting the property you know up and ready to rent on pad split some of those aren't going to be applicable um but you know you're looking at every day your operating costs are 120 dollars a day you're losing mm -hmm. out of pocket until this thing is up and open for business right yeah so you, you know for this deal right here you know it's all the you go through all this headache to to there's no room for error there's just no room for error. And not yeah. only that, you're saying right here, the the total operating costs is, or excuse me, the total entry fee is about 50. Yeah. Right. So we're going to say about 50, let's call it 50 or 55. You know, I always say, look, go worst case scenario, not best case scenario, and always include like a 5k old shit fund. Right. Yeah. You know, you open up a can of worms. You don't know what's going to happen. Right. So you said net net earlier, max 500 bucks a month. Right. Mm-hmm times 12, that's $6,000 a year, right? That's best, best, best case scenario. You're $6,000 a year. If we're in this, let's let's call it 55 to be on the safe side. Um, divided by 55,000, that's a 10.9% uh, uh, cash on cash return. Not worth it. You can do a long-term rental and get that return, you know? Yeah. The when I'm looking at these type of deals, Matt, I always look at them like if I'm going to do this headache with the reno, the furnishings, deal with the, mm -hmm. the members, I want to be upwards of 20 to 30 percent cash on cash return. Yeah. Right. I don't you know, I can go out there and get a long term rental and get a 10 percent cash on cash return. Doesn't yeah. you know, doesn't make sense now. When I look at these deals, I'm like shooting for like 20%, 22, 30, upwards, anywhere between 20 to 30. If it's a little shy of 20% cash on cash, I'm okay with that. Yeah. But I want to be able to yield at least, you know, a 20% cash on cash to do all this headache, you know? So there's a lot of money in the deal, guys, that's stuck in there. Mm -hmm. That would have potentially borrow from a, a PML, which is a private money lender. That's a lot of money to deal, uh, money stuck in this deal, you know? Yeah. And it's going to be hard for you to pay that private money lender back. And that's best, best case scenario. Worst, worst case scenario, he's losing money on this deal. So remember, you guys need to have a little room for error in there. Like I always like to look at worst, worst case scenario where at least I'm still cash flowing and there's room for error. Yeah, for I, I, yeah I, would say, I would say after going through all the numbers and, and uh, considering kind of like where we're going to get the money to invest in this, 
Um, I this would this actually doesn't make sense. The numbers don't make sense for the Pat split because there's there's not enough money left over for cash flow. No. Um, and so, um, to be honest, like the only option now I feel for this, which which again is a headache for somebody, is because you're getting and you're taking over the subject to mortgage at the price is the fix and flip option, which is get in there, renovate it, and try to sell it for four hundred thousand, but. The, is the ARV even 400? That's the question. Well, well, yeah, I think the ARV is 400 if it's reno renovated and there's 60 grand in equity there. But, but not, but again, right. You're again, that's a high risk still. Yeah. Remember I walk the property in the neighborhood. Who's going to pay. This is my subjective. Like maybe somebody will pay 400 for that home. Once it's renovated in that property, yeah. it is a big lot. There's a lot they could do to it, but me personally, and again, it could just be my own taste. I wouldn't pay 400 to live in that neighborhood right next to the highway right no. now this year. Maybe no. when more homes and more of the community have maybe been, you know, renovated a bit. And it's, you know, because man, 400,000 is a lot of money. Like yep. you can get a lot of great things for 400,000, go an hour east into the, into the, to the countryside. You can get something really nice. So that's like the final, that would be the final option where you can make some money on this deal. But now you're hoping it up that someone buys it for 400,000 once it's renovated. Yep. I, and I don't think that's the case. So yeah, the it looks like, you know, you know, whoever, you know, the investor or whoever the wholesaler is getting this deal from, whether it's, I think it's another investor is probably why he's in pain and wants to get out of it. Cause he's like, man, there's like, <laughs> well, he, he locked up a deal that he can't move. Right. And yeah. Well, yeah, the wholesaler for sure. I mean, the wholesaler needs the wholesaler is trying to find an investor that's willing to go through the headache to yep. getting it to fix and flip and get it back to market. That, yeah, yeah, and that's just not us, and it's not. And so, you know, yeah, yeah. that's another thing, man. Like I told you yesterday, you know, there's already code enforcement up your ass on this deal. Like, you know, oh, of you, course, yeah, and you have to take care of the code enforcement violations. You know, I'm not a fan of that, man. You already have them all up in your biz, you know, and and you want to go the pad split route. Not that, again, not that you're doing anything illegal, which is code enforcement aren't easy to deal with. And for that code enforcement violation, I prefer the seller to take care of it, close it out. That way, when you take care or you uh, get the property needed to you, you start from a, a blank canvas, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. The only, yeah. I'm, you know, as we continue to go down to like, try to see like how this would work is the only thing would be is do uh convert it back to single family home um don't do any renovations don't drop any money into it and try to find a local long term renter for 2600 bucks a month to try to make a couple hundred dollars like by the time you factor in though you're at 24 and change on the PITI right mm -hmm, yeah on a long term rental you factor in again 5 to 10% on capex right yeah. it's an old home you might want to go a little bit higher then you're going to factor in about 5% in uh, vacancies right once you factor in all that plus another eight to ten percent in management cost, because remember you're not trying to create a job, you're trying to you know yeah. deliver somebody else. You yeah, don't it's tough. To, it's tough to find any anything not, that's positive on this deal. Market, what's market rent on this deal? Would you say? Have you looked at it or not? Not yet. Uh, yeah, I mean, single family was uh, actually under twenty four hundred. Yeah, under twenty was under, twenty twenty two. Yeah. The PITI is more than what you can even get in rent. So you you know you you can automatically eliminate that right off right off the yeah. gate, you yeah. know? Oh yeah. yeah. So when you guys are looking at these exits, guys, there's very simple things that you look at. Like for instance, what we just talked about on a long-term rental, like you can elim eliminate that right away, right? Don't spend your time looking at these exits if the numbers don't make sense, right? You don't have to go through this methodical underwriting to do all, to understand if a deal is going to make sense or not, right? Yeah. And so pick one or two things, stick with it, and see if it aligns with what your your uh, investing goals are. Everybody's investing goals are different. Don't compare my investing goals to uh, Matt. He doesn't compare his to mine, you know, vice versa. Like we're all in different positions. We all have different shoes on. So make sure when you're looking and analyzing deals that you're seeing what fits you the best at that point in time where you're at in your life. Because as you grow, your investment strategy is actually going to change, right? It will continue to change. So yeah. yeah, this is just too much. This is just too much work and out of my wheelhouse with way too much stuff going on for it to to make sense for, uh, for me specifically to to even you know get my feet wet in this deal. Um, yeah. There's just so many un uh, un uh, uh, variables that are just don't know what's going to happen. So yeah. I wouldn't. I'm not gonna. I would. I'm not moving forward with this. Yeah, so I'll reach I'm out glad. To 
Eckler and let him know, like, hey, like, just not a deal that I'm looking for. And yeah, I'm glad, but I want to, I want to, I want to mention something. And I knew this, I, I knew this from the beginning. This wouldn't be a deal for you, but what I wanted you to do, I wanted you to go through this process. I wanted you to walk the property. I wanted you to talk to the wholesaler. I wanted you to have conversations and ask questions that you've never asked before. So you can understand the lingo. You can understand the sequence. You can understand uh, how it works, working with another person on trying to get a deal to work, right? Also, you also came in here and you also plugged in all these uh, data points on how to underwrite a, uh, on a deal. Like mm -hmm. you're taking imperfect action. And that's where people get stuck is they want everything to be perfect. They want the the pretty, the shiny, uh, you know, uh, uh, thing to be all perfect and spotless. Like you're not looking for perfection. You're not looking for something to be spotless. You actually went in here, you took action, you walked yeah. the property. You're like, I remember you, you told me about this deal. You said, man, yeah, I'm going to Tampa tomorrow. I'm going to walk the doctor's deal. What I like about that is you're in a position right now to where you're a new investor. It's good for you to see something that is tangible and feel it and walk through it and smell it and see the area. And you've learned so much good things and so many positive things just out of this one property mm -hmm. as you grow obviously you'll get more robust in your systems and processes and you'll be like you know what this is not worth me to drive over there but today when you walk through the property it was worth you walking through it because you got to see the property you got to talk through the property with me you got to shoot a video you know so you're doing yep. all this stuff and this is like this is where people get caught is like they're afraid to do this stuff like they just they, what they do is they watch our video and they're like, never go and take action. Yeah. Take what you've learned from this video, guys, and apply one thing. I stopped the I stopped the screen share so that way we can get into the, oh. the exit side. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was take, on me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought my computer uh died. No, uh, you're good. Yeah. Take one one thing and start up implementing right away, guys. Don't eat the whole elephant at once. Take it a, a bite at a time. And so that's yeah. the most thing and that's what i like about what you did here is you came up with the whole scenario you came up with a, a imperfect blueprint and you went and presented it to me i'm able here to talk through the numbers with you see he's collaborating with me mm -hmm. he doesn't have all the answers i don't have all the answers guys i've been doing this for a long time none of us is perfect no, no one has all the answers but we're working through this together yeah no, and, and you pointed out a lot of the stuff that i wasn't really even thinking about in terms of just like the monthly operating experiences um, and that was even before we try to maybe go out and get somebody's money to use to take the deal down because you got to pay that back too, right? So I'm like, whoa, all right, there's a lot here. Um, I, just not me doing exact math, but on PML costs on a deal like this, you're probably about five, six hundred bucks a month. Yeah, yeah, that's what it came up to on a calculator I found, and it was like, yeah, I was like, dang, now we haven't even calculated that. We're already even if we're positive, like we're kind of like breaking even. Do I want to go through all that? Does any investor want to go through all this headaches and uncertainty? And so um, also uh, on my channel, uh, we'll link it down below, but um, I'll have the first two videos that I shot leading up to this third video here with Javier. Yeah. Um, because um, if you're a new investor and you're here, or even if you're a seasoned investor, I'm trying to document the whole journey as a new investor of like, what are the steps I'm taking, the drive out to Tampa, walking the property, and then now sitting down and running the numbers and saying like, well, like these are the steps to determine on whether or not I need to move forward on a deal or not. Um, and again, even if it's not with my own money, like if this was a deal and we include a PML and go borrow money from someone else, it's still not a deal. So no one's taking this deal. That's why it's being hard, no. uh, it's hard to sell right now. So no. let me ask you this though. Now that you've kind of, you not kind of, you've analyzed this deal going forward when you're getting another wholesaler or a realtor or, or somebody sending you a deal, or maybe you're out getting deals and sourcing deals yourself direct to seller. You have learned so many things and now there's so many red flags. You can automatically just sniff within seconds to know if it's a deal. Start killing deals quickly is what yeah. my big takeaway for you. Kill them quickly. Figure out why they're not going to work out because that yeah. way you can move on. And that's why it's important to have your buy box. Like that way you don't go outside of it. And when people send you all this noise to your, to your inbox, you can just be like, oh, next, 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 next. No, that's, absolutely. That's, that's what yeah, I do. Yeah. That's exactly what I do. No, absolutely. And, and I got lots of insight on that, especially with your insight around kind of like code enforcement, right? If this yep. deal had come to the table with less code enforcement, kind of as like the, we may be more likely to deal with it because we don't have to worry about like not being occupied and dealing with all this code stuff. But because there's code enforcement involved, yep. it throws an uncertainty wrench in the whole thing. And you're like, ah, man, just to break even or maybe make a couple bucks. Is it worth all the time, worth headache it. and energy? 
not worth it. So cool. Yeah. Awesome. So um, Javier, um, go ahead and let people know, obviously, you know, we're going to roll out of this uh, show for today where they can find you yeah. and what we've, I've got, uh, what we've got going on with our recent uh, Path Split yeah. Mini course. Absolutely. So guys, if you guys are interested, um, I've been getting a lot of people reaching out, asking me a lot of questions about Path Split because it's obviously something new and it's getting a lot of traction now. What I've done in this most recent uh, property that I just launched on Pad Split, and I'm, I'm at uh, 50% occupancy rate already within the last uh, about 20 days or so on Pad Split Live. I've consolidated and I've created a mini course so you guys do not have to do all the guessing work. You can all, and learn how to analyze a market. You can learn how to stage and do renovations all step by step by step. You can learn how to do all this without having to go through all the pitfalls right here in the uh, pad split mini course that I've created. So make sure you guys uh, will have that in the description below. We'll have the link to that. We'll also have the link to my YouTube channel. That way you guys can like and subscribe and follow us through the journey because we're going to continue continue to give content and value you guys. That way you guys can see how to lock up deals, how to acquire deals, how to underwrite deals. This was just a really quick brief underwriting guys. We're going to get even more in depth on underwriting. Like we talked about a couple of different uh, exit strategies. We didn't go in that depth in them. We just really barely touched the surface on them. So if you guys want to be able to have access to this mini course, make sure you click the, the description below and make sure you follow us and uh, subscribe to our channel on YouTube. And that way you can stay up to date with all the content and everything we're going to deliver to you today. Right now, we're in the last day of 2023 when we made this video, which is happy new year's to everyone. And we're excited for all the content and all the value add that we're going to give you guys in 2024. So don't forget, click the description below for more information. And I'm going to see you guys on the next one. I'm very excited, guys. Let's go. Take care.